What is going on, everybody? Good evening and welcome. I guess this is kind of like a special edition of Tatro Talks. Hello to all my friends in the chat. Thank you all for being here tonight for a little special edition interview in the evening, a little after dark. Um, I'm excited, really excited for our guests, really excited for this chat tonight, and it looks like a bunch of you all are excited as well. So thank you for joining me. I want to shout out all the members. First of all, what's up, Julio? What's up, Jay? STK? Uh, Hunter, what's going on, Rashain, STK, Drunk Bishop, Samuel Messiah, Amen. Thank you all for being here. Um, and everybody else in between. What's going on, Sala, Eddie, Taco Bell? Uh, some people that were here on the morning stream, here in the evening stream, showing up to both. We love that. Thank you for being here. Um, oh, my mom's in the chat. We love that, too. It's not too late over there on the East Coast, I guess. Um, Zaire, hello. Superman is in the chat. Zenia Francisco, welcome everybody. If you want to just drop where you're watching from this evening in the chat, that would be great. It'd be awesome to know. Like I said, really awesome chat that's happening right now here. I'm so excited and I don't want to do too much of an intro, but I do want to remind you all not to forget that we put these interviews and clips from the show, the talk show, the uh, call-in show earlier today, we put those in the podcast feed. So Tatro Radio on your favorite podcast platform. But of course, if you want to catch things live, turn on notifications, make sure you subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. So let's start getting into the interview today. Amazing guest, uh, producer, songwriter, top line writer, been in the industry for a while. If you want to know about um, working in the music industry, being a career musician, writing Billboard and iTunes chart topping hits, this is the place to be because we have the amazing Alina Smith with us today. Alina, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, what's up? <laughs> I'm so happy to have you on. Um, I'm really stoked that uh, the chat seems super stoked as well. I will, before I ask the first question, I'll just want to give the little background on how I discovered your work and what you do. Um, I... My friend Joseph, who's in the chat, Mod, that I also live with, got me into K-pop about like a year ago. And, you know, it's been a journey getting into different groups. Of course, one of the groups we got into or he got me into was Itzy. And they just dropped a little mini album, really banger tracks on this album, including the lead single, uh, Mafia in the Morning. And listen to that album just came out like a couple weeks ago. I don't know how long it's been now. And I had somehow come across your YouTube channel before that and had seen like you'd been doing tutorials, like really awesome, like pop music tutorials with as part of your duo, Liar. Um, and that It's the album comes out. I'm like, this track is a banger. I really want to learn more about like the production style. And lo and behold, I find you uh, are have credits on the track, produce the track, pitch that track and have a tutorial out breaking down the track so that is how i discovered basically you and your work and it's just like crazy to be connected this way so i'm just giving chat some context that's how i discovered you and your work in general but i guess my first question for you is um i said all these things about what you do top line writer songwriter um producer all that but how do you define what you do and, and when people ask you what do you do how do you describe it to them you know, it's a really hard question to answer because I think like, especially here in LA, like we all do so many different things. Totally. It's, I feel like the age of specialization is coming to an end. Like everybody kind of has their hands on a lot of different pots. So I think like primarily I would say my, I'm a producer, but to be like really real, like I'm just as much of a top line <laughs> as a producer. Sure. Um, I just, a lot of the times end up taking more of a production role because in you know songwriting sessions there's usually at least one or two other top liners you know my partner la is a top liner and there's usually the artist they're writing sometimes even another top liner so i kind of like try not to be like too many cooks in the kitchen kind of vibe like right. if i need to back off i back off if i need to step in on the top line especially with k-pop too because i've been writing asian music since like 2008 2009 wow. <laughs> so i do know like quite a bit about it so a lot of times i just kind of keep an eye on you know writers and if there's just like something comes to mind i'll suggest it but you know that's basically kind of the overview you know i do a lot of other things i write as well i write articles i just finished writing a book so that's but, crazy you know yeah just, polymath vibes <laughs> i want to get into all of it do you want to real quick just break down like what is a top line writer for folks in the audience who of, might not know of course of course so 
basically pop music breaks down like in the industry the way it's thought of it breaks down into track and top line so the track is you know the track it's the music <laughs> it's the backing music and then top line is basically the songwriting which is kind of interesting this comes from the fact that a lot of songwriting is now done two tracks right like back in the day people wrote on piano or guitar which I still do all the time. Yeah. I really like like old school writing, but a lot of the times, you know, professional sessions when people get together to write for Korean artists or write for US artists or whatever it is, you know, it's very like there's somebody making a track in the room and then there's people, top liners writing the song. So basically to make it easy, top line is the songwriting. Right. It's, yeah, it's a song, lyrics and melody. Yeah, cool. So Take me through, like, what was your entry point into the industry? How did you even get started doing this work? Well, I was always interested in music. I was in a kid's band when I was, like, six. Wow. <laughs> and we toured all around Europe, which is where I'm from. Um, you know, and when I got a little bit older, I just didn't want to stop. You know how it is, like, a lot of the times we, you do, like, any sort of arts as a kid and then you become a teenager and the parents are like, get, you know, you got to focus on a real career. And yeah. luckily nobody ever told me that. So I was just like, oh, I guess I'm going to keep making art. So, you know, I came to the U.S. when I was 17 and I just immediately started pursuing doing this. And to be honest, I knew nothing <laughs> like about the U.S., like songwriting, production, scene, how to become an artist. I really just didn't know anything, didn't know anybody. I wow. moved here and literally didn't have any friendships, like nothing, any relationships. So it was definitely a really long and hard road. <laughs> totally. it, I think it took me probably longer to get to this point than most people that I know that are at this point. Uh, just, I think, because of, like, the cultural, like, immigration thing, you know, all of those things kind of just add extra challenges. But, yeah, basically, when I first got here, just to kind of condense all of this, you know, I was just writing by myself, like, on piano. I had, I think, Cubase back in 2005 That's or whatever cool. it was, just trying to, like, record myself. Like, I literally had, like, a, you know, those dynamic mics plugged into, like, the side of the yes. little laptop, like, doing stuff like that, you know. And I, you know, at some point did level up a little bit and start working. I got a little bit more of, like, a professional Pro Tools setup, and then I started collaborating with you know some some other writers and i'm this is i might be like because this is so long ago but i'm pretty sure i met a producer on craigslist oh wow who was the japanese actually a very successful japanese producer and he was looking for top liners and i didn't really fully produce then i was like 18 so i you know i was like yeah i'll write a song and that's actually when i got my first j-pop uh cuts and it kind of just like progressed from there and I had a lot of different ups and downs. I went to Nashville for a while. I got a publishing deal in Nashville and it was mostly focused on writing country music, which is really interesting to think about now because I like country music, but it's not like my primary love. Yeah. So it was just a lot of this, you know, and then in Nashville, I met my partner, Ellie, who I am in liar now with in my team. And once we kind of got together as a team, it was very obvious, like there was just some sort of magic there. And together we started writing a little bit more. At first it was for her project. Um, she was super young at the time. She was 18 and she didn't, we were both in Nashville. There's not a lot of pop producers there. So she was like, Hey, like, will you produce some songs for me? You know, we were just really good friends. And at that time I mostly produced country. I got really good at producing country, but I yeah. didn't really produce pop yet. So I was like, Oh, I'll try. <laughs> I'll give it a try. And you know, it wasn't good. <laughs> it wasn't good because it was my first pop stuff, but Funny enough, it got us back into writing K-pop again and J-pop. So, and from then on, we kind of migrated to LA because this is where, you know, it's a lot easier to do global music here than yeah. it is in Asia, which is more country focused. Yeah, I want. I, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I want to get into all of that. I want to go back a little bit, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about like the publishing deal and being in Nashville and and what that was kind of like. Because I think for a lot of folks. Um, 
I don't, I don't think people understand beyond being just an artist, I guess you made the idea of a top line writer very, very accessible for people. But what did the, what, what did it look like with that publishing deal in Nashville? And what was that work like? It was a very unusual publishing deal. It's not, this is not the norm at all, especially not now. I feel like I got it in 2014 and I literally just exited it this month, May 1st. Interesting. So I was in it for seven years Wow. and things have really changed, but I will, you know, give you like yeah. what it was. So basically I moved to Nashville because I got it in my head that I wanted to be a country singer. <laughs> it's kind of funny looking back at it now because I'm not country. I'm like, foreign <laughs> literally like have nothing in common with country music i don't know why i got so passionate about, about wanting to be a country singer and writer but there we go i yeah. went to Nashville, moved did the whole thing so and what i was there for maybe a year and a half and i was honestly just throwing myself out there taking any opportunity to like be seen perceived in any way were you um, like because what i used to do when i was younger was like i would be because you mentioned craigslist i would be on craigslist like every job posting website and just be searching like music like composition songwriting producer like i, I would search yeah, all those things yeah that's honestly that's an amazing way to do it and i think a lot of people don't realize like how cold emailing if it's done right and like yeah. reaching out to people can actually work and i'll get into that in a second because i have a good a couple awesome. of stories about that um but basically yeah, i was in nashville kind of i still had nothing going on i was already in the us for like seven or eight years still kind of couldn't figure much shit out for me <laughs> but yeah. uh basically i was like i'm gonna do anything that i need to do to meet people because honestly like I'm pretty introverted and especially now I'm like 33. I'm like married, settled. Like yeah. <laughs> I don't like want to go to a bar. <laughs> Let's be real. But at that time, you know, I was just like, I will go out and meet people and do whatever I need to do, even though this is like not really in my nature. So I sang in just about every little crappy country bar with like two people watching. I would bring a guitar and freaking sing my songs. I would reach out to any writer that I could find that might want to write with me. And I found literally people on Facebook. I think now it would be more like Instagram or TikTok. Right. At that time, it was Facebook. So I reached out to several writers that, you know, were had cuts, like had things going on. And you know, a lot of them didn't write me back. A lot of them, and this is this, please don't do this. You guys, when you get, when you guys get like more successful, please don't do this to people that are like starting out. They would book sessions and then can cancel them the day off. Whoa. I literally don't ever do that now. Like if I don't want to work with somebody, I just like don't work with them or yeah. don't give them any false hopes. Like that sucks. <laughs> But uh, I met one girl that was a writer signed to Sony. She's had, you know, several singles, um, was a really good, like, pop writer mostly, but she did write a little bit of country, and she just took a liking to me. She was like, wow, you're a girl, you, like, know how to produce, and you do all this stuff yourself, like, and you're young, like, let's be friends. So I met her, and she ended up kind of introducing me to some people, and kind of helping me get a little bit more into the scene, and at the same time, I was still, like, singing everywhere doing all the things that I had to do you know posting like at that time it wasn't even as big but like doing literally everything yeah so and you know I did that for about a year and a half after about a year and a half in Nashville I had like a steady like stream of writers that I was working with a lot of them were signed I wasn't signed and that's like one of those things I will say it's probably not like that in LA especially the there's I hate to say this but there's definitely an, like a hierarchy of writers right like I talked to somebody yesterday who I think is extremely successful. Like she has very, very big singles and many of them. And she was still talking about how she can't get this. She can't get this because wow. like the A-list writers get those, those opportunities to write for, you know, Justin Bieber or like right. the, the Ariana Grande, like the top artists. So there's definitely a hierarchy and, you know, the people I was working with were more just like, starting out signed writers or they had like one single with somebody like that kind of tier of writers and not meaning like talent wise more just like development yeah. in in your career yeah so um and i basically ended up meeting publishers like those people's publishers through them kind of getting to know them another thing i did too is my music at the time had a really interesting sound i think it's hilarious now like laugh at it now but it was when uh, bro country was first becoming big it was like the rap and yeah. country kind of mixture so and i was basically like rap singing over country beats 
So I started literally sending out cold emails to publishers, titling them Country Kesha. Oh, we love that. <laughs> Kesha was like hot at the time. Yes. And believe it or not, I got a lot of people to listen, to write back and meet, got meetings from that. And I ended up signing my publishing deal from that. Wow. As funny as that back. sounds, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it all depends, of course, on like, quality of your work I I was pretty confident I knew like what I had at that time was like pretty interesting like really worked with what was going on yeah so you know I wasn't afraid to like put myself out there or look stupid or anything so I think that's important that, that's huge that always works so and yeah and basically once I got my publishing deal uh which for anybody that's you know going to be signing looking to be signed like courting publishers is definitely a process um it takes Mm, six months to a year just to court like what they usually do and uh, i'll back her for a second too for those that don't know what publishers do so basically they're like a record label but for songwriters or producers so they focus on getting a writer to like grow in their career so get artists to record your songs you know get artists to use your beats that is what they do. Plus they also, there's all this businessy stuff like with royalties and you can look all of that up. But right. Basically like that's kind of the, it overview. gets real complicated. It gets very complicated, very yeah. fast. And a lot of very professional writers still don't understand royalties. So <laughs> <laughs> that's about great it. insight. People need to yeah, hear that. There's, there's type, certain types of those things. I'm still like, what does this mean? Uh, <laughs> so, but basically, yeah. So in Nashville, it took me about six months to like court my publisher. And what that means is they put you in sessions. They basically like have you write with, this writer, this writer, this producer, just to kind of see how you do, what kind of songs you come up with. And if they like what you're doing, they might sign you. So that's what ended up happening. And then the legal process also takes like three to six months. Wow. So prepare. Is it structured like, uh, similar to a, like a record deal where you kind of go into contract and, and they're looking for X amount of songs that are going to go get recorded? It like-, be like It can be like that. It's a little bit like depends on where it is too. Um, my deal was like that it was 12 songs a year, like fully written composition. So let's say if I co-wrote a song with my partner, Ellie, that counts as half song. Right. So, you know, it's not a very high requirement at all, to be honest. Like it's pretty good. A lot of LA deals are not number of songs requirement, but number of cuts. So you have to get those songs recorded and they have to be released. Wow. Which is where it gets really tricky. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them have recoupment and all these crazy things. I could talk about that for an hour, but totally. you can also Google a lot, of, a lot of these things. Yeah. Wow. So that's intense. So you were in that for a while. Like you said, you just got I, out of it. Yeah. I was in that for a while. And it was very interesting too because they signed me because they were interested in me as a country artist. Interesting. And what happened, just being super transparent, like, I prepared a country project, which I still really like. I think it's dope. I'd love for somebody else to sing it, to be honest. Um, but I got pitched with that project and to like two or three labels and they all turned me down, which is what happens a lot of the times. And, you know, at that time, my publisher was like, Ugh, you know, we were like really hoping you'd get signed and you didn't. So you should work on getting some cuts, AKA mm. getting other artists to record your songs. But the problem in Nashville, and it's still a problem like this many years later, it's crazy. Um, there aren't a lot of female artists in Nashville at all that are wow. signed, that are like doing well. There's like three to five women, really, <laughs> in yeah. all of country music. And everybody else is, an, is a man, which is fine. But for a female writer, that's very that's very tough, you know, yeah. because we write mostly for women. Like, we will record the demo. It's a woman's voice. From so, that perspective. I knew that it would be super hard with the kind of deadline they were giving me for me to like save my deal. So that's actually when Ellie and I got together and we were like, what are we like, what are we going to do? You know, I need this deal. I need this money. <laughs> like, yeah. what are we doing? And that's when I, I remembered, wait, when I was a kid, I had this K-pop, J-pop situation that I was in and I, I got a cut really easily there. Why don't we try that? And this, yet again, we had no relationships. The only thing I had going really for me is that I was a signed writer. Right. Um, that was it, you know, and that's, to be honest, it's not saying much. A lot of people are signed. It's 
what really matters more is like your cuts, like right. what songs have you had. But out. it's still like one step above all the other cold emails that it, they might it get. Def- it definitely is. It helps a little bit. Yep. So what we did back to the cold emails, we started again, hitting people up on Facebook. We found writers in Korea and writers in Sweden, because that's also all of Scandinavia is like a really big hot spot for writing Asian music. They're right. like amazing at pop music there. So we hit up a bunch of people. It was easier at the time because I did have, you know this like credential of being signed and we just started writing to any track people would send us we would put together situations um basically like if we met a track person producer because i wasn't like as good at producing back then uh i was mostly top lining so we would meet a producer here and then get a brief here uh, like oh red velvet is looking for a song like this we'd be like okay so let's ask this guy who we think would be good at making this kind of track to make a track for this and we will write to it so that's how we did it and we actually got several cuts like almost right away wow like, two guns which is you know like we got really lucky so and from then on we just started getting invited to k-pop camps like we started kind of being more like in that scene and the rest is history (laughs) it's such a crazy jump to have jumped from this country music scene and then to the k-pop and j-pop world like that's such a leap it's very crazy it only happened because my publisher threatened to drop me (laughs) so you know necessity is the mother of invention for sure Uh, you know, and again, like the cold kind of reaching out, you know, we were a little bit desperate at the time and it really paid off just being like brave and not being afraid to just hit people up and look stupid maybe. Right. And would you say a lot of those connections that you have been making for years and years, are they still kind of paying off today? Is it like one leads to the other leads to the other and it's this whole network? It is very much like that. Yeah. It's, it, it's it literally is just like you meet this person and this person through them and this person through them and definitely the music industry is it's really a social game and i'll be honest i'm not like that great at it my partner ellie is a lot more of like a social butterfly extrovert um i really enjoy talking to people and getting to know people but more like one-on-one sure. quality like really get to know them as opposed to like kind of hopping around right so you know it is it can be challenging and i know that a lot of writers that are incredible writers um do struggle with that sometimes because i think a lot of writers and producers tend to be pretty introverted for sure producers you know you sit there by yourself making tracks like exactly so i definitely feel that for sure i'm definitely an introverted person and going out and networking even though it is so important, it's it's super hard. It's challenging. It is hard. And I think it's a little easier now with social media because yeah. you can just DM somebody like, Hey, what's up? Like it's a little, it's a little bit, it works a little bit better now, you know, back in the day when it was all like chance, like you meet somebody at a coffee shop, right. or you meet somebody at a bar. it was tougher. Uh, I just think there's many more opportunities now too with social media. Um, I meet, you know, people like you on social media all the time. It's really cool. Like, you know, even in COVID, like right. we can, we can get connected. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, you have mentioned a couple times about um, your partnership and you being part of the duo Liar. And I, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit more about that and about how um, being a part of a duo and having a partner working with somebody, um, how did that sort of change things for you Um and not just being solo? Honestly, it it was definitely the breakthrough point for me. It really, really elevated my career and honestly life too, because doing this on your own is really tough. It is really hard. Um, There's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of rejection. There's just a lot of confusion too, trying to figure out how to do things. So two heads are better than one. My partner, Ellie, she's really smart, you know, together we have kind of complementary strengths, like I mentioned with like the introvert extrovert thing, Um, even, you know, the way we write, um, she is very good at just kind of dialing in, um, like for the project, as opposed to just like, oh, let's be wildly creative, right? Uh, which I think you know, both are very valid and marrying the two is like where the magic lives is where 
you can kind of follow directions because a lot, especially for K-pop, you get these instructions from a rs labels like of what they want. Yeah. So yeah, between the two of us, we just have a lot of these complementary strengths. Um, and I do think having two people like work at a career is definitely like elevated things as well. You know, when I'm busy working on attraction, might be writing back to some emails, like when I am doing this or whatever, she might be, um, going through our catalog and yeah. you know what I'm it's saying? divide like, and conquer. Yeah. Divide and conquer. So, and a lot of the times too, like she, before COVID, like she would go out and meet this person and this person becomes an artist that we work with, um, you know, where she will perform somewhere and she'll meet somebody through that. And we end up working with that person. Yeah. So, and then it was the same for me as well. Like if somebody comes from more from the, from the production side to me and I find like a way that, Oh, like, Ellie can be really great in a situation. I always bring her in. It's it's like a homie situation, you know. For sure. Like we always like ride or die for each other. Yeah. I want to real quickly say hello to everybody in the chat. Yes, I see you all. My name is getting tagged. Hi, Manny. Hi, music producer Ghost. What's going on? I saw Diana jump in there. If you all have questions and they make sense in the conversation, please feel free to drop them in the chat as we get in and I'll try to um, work them in smoothly if they go with the flow, of course. So if you all have questions, please drop them in the chat as they come up because I want to get you all uh, involved and you can ask Alina a question as well. So that sounds like um, a kind of a dream situation, finding a partner like that where you can, you know, really just have synergy and work off of each other that way. Uh, that's super amazing. I, I wonder, like, when you guys were starting to get into some of the K-pop and J-pop stuff, um, what was the biggest difference from, like, a Western, like, American markets and writing and working on that kind of music? I think there, there, there's quite a few differences. I think one of the biggest one is, ones is the label's involvement. I feel like, so when you write for pitch, so to like pitch a song to an artist, a lot of the times in America, you don't really get like a lot of information for what they're looking for. Really like who gets the information is like the top, 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 top producers right. and writers. Like the like ones that write all the big hits are the ones that kind of get that information and those opportunities. Literally everybody else, even the other hit writers are just like not quite there yet. Right. Like nobody gets that info. So it can be really confusing and it can be very like sort of haphazard. Like a lot of the stories I hear of people that get really big major breakthroughs with songs. It's very like, Oh, I just happened to have this song. It was really great. My manager sent to somebody and whoop to do it happened. It's wow. like super, like it's hard to build a career that way because of how haphazard it is. Yeah. So for K-pop, it's actually really great. Like if you're a structured person <laughs> that likes organization, you will love K-pop because their ARs tell everybody what they're looking for. They're very like democratic. They kind of don't care if you're a really big writer or if you're just like a new person starting That's out. Good. They don't really care about oh. the song, which is really great. So they will tell you the themes they're looking for. They'll tell you the musical style they're looking for. They'll literally be like, we're looking for a marriage of Western country music and EDM. You know, course, they'll yeah. have like their whole kind of vision planned out for the album or EP. So that makes it a lot easier for writers to like shoot for something, you know, and actually easier to like land that shot as opposed to just being like, I don't know what anybody's looking for. Nobody's taking songs in the West. Like what the heck? Um, while, you know, in Korea, they're very communicative. So that's on like more the business side. I think on the creative side, it's just more the difference between like the Asian style writing and production or, and Western. I definitely think tempos are much slower in the West. It's kind of like that whole right. chill thing, you know. And then in Asia, a lot of the times with the big singles, they just want to dance. They want those bangers. High right? energy bangers, yeah. Really high energy. And it's, this took me a second because I'm honestly, my natural tendencies as a producer is like kind of chiller, more US style. Yeah. So it took me like being like, no more. <laughs> yeah. You got to think like, about that choreography, you know. Yeah, you know, being like growlier 808, more sauce, yeah. <laughs> like louder lead, like more obnoxious, like more glide, you know, like things that I wouldn't really do in like more like a 
cute, tasteful US. Not that it's not tasteful, but you know what I'm trying to say, like right. chiller kind of production. Yeah. So it definitely on the production side, it's just especially when you're going for those hits, they do have like more of the ballads and stuff, but that's like a different thing. If you're going for like those up tempo singles, it's very up tempo. The tempos are faster too. Like it's always like one one twenty eight, you know, for the EDM, yeah. like um etc so sometimes even more <laughs> it, it'd be very very up tempo and as far as the song the top line uh it's they do like a lot of western melodies like very catchy you know what you would think of like as your pop you know western melodies anything like that an artist here like dual leap book cut um but they do like to have more like of the Asian style melody worked in as well, um, which it's really hard to just like describe it with words. If you go listen to just about any K-pop song, like even something Western like Blackpink, like yeah. if you listen to a lot of the pre-choruses, you will be like, oh, those like very interesting kind of moves, maybe some chromatic moves on the melody. right? Like just things they wouldn't really do here, a little more unusual um so that definitely like if you're interested in writing top line you know melody for k-pop definitely study that yeah and it is math it's definitely mathematics vocals there are sections for soaring legato vocals so you know and it always is it's a it's always a challenge because every song is different and you can combine things so differently um but there is definitely a lot of math going on like i probably wouldn't do like rap 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 three sections in a row right. you know and like it was a very slow slow rap fast paced maybe back to slow but most likely i would break it up with a melody or go somewhere else with the track um, yeah. a lot of like somewhere else too so and you're yeah. <laughs> for like top lines and stuff you're writing like full on like english and then it gets then you send it out and then it gets kind of like you talked a little bit about that in the uh, the mafia like breakdown or whatever like you worked you guys worked on the track wrote the top line did it and then send it over and they like convert it all they, korean rewrite it. yeah and it is very interesting how it can work like sometimes with this song talk to me by red velvet they actually kept a lot of the english lyrics um kind of like the candy words like little like baby like just simple like catchy words um and a lot of what they did too which was really interesting for us they took the phonetics of the words like there is there was a part that was like keep it real keep it real keep it real and their korean lyric sounds almost the same i'm not gonna butcher it right. here but it sounds very, very they use the same different. sound even though it's not the same yeah, word yeah sounds like keep, keep it real but like a little bit different so a lot of the times they get inspired by the phonetics of the english but with mafia it was almost literally all different they kept mafia right <laughs> and they kept the ha, -ha. yes yeah, the most <laughs> iconic part of the song yeah so and it is different i've actually chatted with a couple of other k-pop writers um because I'm writing an article in Sound on Sound magazine on K-pop. So I was interviewing Amazing. them. Amazing. Which is so fun. And they also said like, oh yeah, this was called Angels. And now they changed it to Heaven and Hell. Or this was called, um, I forgot what the word was, but it's called On now. So this is so yeah. interesting. So they really take control of the lyric. Yeah. It seems like in, in so much of your work, you have to, because it's so collaborative it's so it must be so different for like writing for your own artist project you kind of like for this stuff have to leave your ego at the door and just like write work with everybody it's gonna get changed it's gonna like there's gonna be a lot of cooks in the kitchen that kind of doing there's different no, things there's no room for ego you're gonna yeah. be hurt if you like get really really attached and trust me i love all the songs we're writing for k-pop i think they're so fun i love them but i don't have like a personal attachment to them like if they want to change something i'm happy because that means they're taking the song for sure um, but yeah, it's it's super different than writing for yourself as an artist. Um, I'm sure this will change because I've just gotten back into being an artist. I was one for a long time in my 20s and then I quit for like five years. Um, and I just got back into it. So right now I do literally everything myself on it. I don't co-write. I don't co-produce. I just write songs literally on guitar and piano. I write them them super old school and then bring them in and produce them as almost as if I'm producing somebody else. Like I kind of put on my producer hat, you know, when I'm writing the song, I'm very much like the artist. It's more about the lyric, the melody, like expressing something that I want to express. I wonder, so do you feel, do you feel, um, 
a, as a better writer for yourself, having done all this work for other people? Hundred percent, Jesus. I. <laughs> It's not even comparable. Last time I did, I wrote for myself was in Nashville when I was doing country stuff. And I always struggled because I just didn't really know what I wanted to say, you know, I was trying to fit this thing that I didn't really fit. You know, it was always like externally taking ideas of like, oh, like trucks are popular. Maybe I can do a song about like mudding in a truck. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I've literally never been mudding in a truck. So this is very inauthentic. And the way I write now is it's super not planned. I don't do sessions for myself. I do production and mixing, but as far as writing, it's like if, if the inspiration strikes, it's usually at night, like around this kind of time, I'll just yeah. pick up a guitar. Oh, I'm feeling this thing. You know, a lot of the times I don't even have a title. Like the song I have called Girl, It Was Perfect. I didn't have anything. I just sit down, picked up a guitar and wrote a song. So, and that's super freeing. And also that's where all the technique comes in. Cause I kind of, I tell myself, this is for me, like it doesn't have to be a hit. It doesn't have to be anything, but yeah. the techniques do come in because they're so ingrained totally. in my mind that even if I'm not consciously thinking about them, they're there. <laughs> I wonder, do you ever have conflicts? Like this song is for me or should this go out and get pitched somewhere? Like, is there ever that kind of war in your mind? Funny, you're, somebody just asked us this the other day too. And I think not so much for my stuff. I kind of don't think my stuff is often that pitchable. It's very like super personal lyrics, like literally. Right. Sometimes I just, I'm not even afraid to write a lyric that I don't think people will understand as long as I understand it. It's, it is very like personal. That's, you know, if I have like no ego and no attachments in my writing for others, and this is like, it's the opposite. It's just like, I write whatever I want. You know, if it happened that a big artist heard a song before it was released and wanted to cut it, 100% they could have it. i I write songs all the time. It's fine. Right. But it's not something I would like consciously try to pitch. You know what I'm saying? Totally. I want to grab some questions from chat. Okay. First one. Jay Scholes asks, is it better to have a label deal or go solo uh, and dealing with all the different platforms individually? What, well, you just got out of your deal. So maybe this is a good time. Yeah. I think his question is more for like an artist as yeah. opposed to a writer. I think it depends really, um, you know, for me as an artist right now, I'm literally so unsigned. It's like almost hilarious. Like I don't have a manager. <laughs> so unsigned. It's, it's, it's funny to me because I definitely could pursue that, but I don't want to right now. Cause the most important thing for me right now with my artistry is, is being able to just put out whatever I want. Your freedom. It's yeah, it's because, you know, I have this other job pretty much as a producer and a writer where all that happens is I constantly get told what I need to do creatively, right? which is great, but it is also, it takes away your agency as an artist and a creator. So for me, the most important thing right now is just to like create what I want to create, how I want to create it, put it out, no expectations. You know, I know that that's not what a lot of people want. Like right. my situation is different because really I'm just trying to supplement like what happens in my professional life as a writer producer with this project, which is for love. Now, if somebody came in, you know, management, whatever that honored that we could talk for sure. Yeah. But it's also very new for me. So I'm not, you know, I'm not like jumping at it for it's sure very, i'm preferring just to develop it slowly now if you i would definitely say it is a lot easier to move with a label it is very very difficult to get your song placed on playlists like spotify playlists like curated playlists right apple the only songs of mine that i've had placed in those playlists have been label releases right uh, mm -hmm. Actually, no, I will amend that. We've had like a few very random, like one of Ellie's songs one was on New Music Friday Sweden. Interesting. <laughs> because none of us are Swedish. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know. uh, but a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the times it's, I would say it's like extremely tough to get an, any editorial playlist, which is the number one kind of way things get. It's how to people suffer. discover you. Yeah. You know, budgeting is a tough thing too. Um, 
definitely like some of the better music videos we shot for my partner ellie they've cost 10 to fifteen thousand dollars which is a lot of money yeah you know and if you're trying to get your career going you need at least two of those a year probably yeah. four so you know and that's a really tough thing i hate telling people this because like i would have like cried 10 years ago if people told me like like how can you even years. imagine yeah like, you like... can't imagine that amount of money you know so and even now like i'm not really yet willing to spend the kind of money on my artist project like you know right. i'll do a lyric video here like a little cheaper video but definitely you know it's like a push and pull situation because you want to have the beautiful visuals, the great pictures, all those things. But all of that costs a lot of money. Or you so, end up doing stuff what, yourself and that just takes your time. And and like now you're spending your time, time doing that instead of the music. Yeah. And, you know, I will tell you for sure, like a video like Gateway or OK, that we shot for Ellie, like we couldn't do that ourselves. Right. There's no way. You know, there was a huge crew there. Amazing cameras editing like all lighting all of those things like you can't do that yourself right. so i would say it's like a push and pull i'd say for anybody just starting out i would say start out on your own build yourself up more grassroots you know get like very cheap lyric videos done on like fiber or something like that um you know really just focus on the quality of your music and this is this is like not really answering the question but i'm gonna say this anyway the most important thing is what your music sounds like in the beginning. So, you know, if you're going to invest money into anything, it's that. That's amazing advice because I think a lot of people get caught up in the social media, like the visual aspect, how you present yourself, which of course is important, but that's really affirming to hear you say the sound is, is it most. Is, it is important. And, you know, people will definitely look at that but the sound is number one i remember back in even back in nashville my publisher was always just like showing me things that get pitched to them like sent in the mail like these gorgeous like cds back you know back in the days when cds were relevant or like these like spread like catalogs almost of these like artists it's like beautiful pictures printed out glossy but the music sucks so right. nobody cares yeah. So, you know, and that's one of those things like if I had to advise like what to spend your, you know, limited budget on in the beginning, it's hiring producers and writers. <laughs> because right. it took me close to 15 years to figure out 10 to, to figure out how to like really write a song that's a hit. <laughs> right. It's really 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 hard and it takes so long and it's just like not even a talent thing. It's like an experience like just hours in the bag kind of thing. Sure. So yeah, by yourself, I mean, yes, you can definitely do amazing things, but working with people that are experienced, that's just going to elevate. Anything. Totally. Um, another question from chat is about kind of like, um, like I guess pay structure from the publishing deals. Like, do you get points on the song? Do you, are you just selling the song outright? Like the publisher owns the song and you're just getting paid like a salary. Like how does that work? Don't don't sign the things where they own everything. That's not good. Not <laughs> you good. Get no royalties when that happens. That's don't do that. Don't don't sell your rights. That's that's your royalties. That's your living. Um, with publishers, usually they're doing copubs now. So um, my deal was actually copub with BMG and another company, smaller company. Um, so I think I had like thirty three percent. I'm pretty sure of like all of my publishing. So it's it's pretty good. You know, it's, it's some if it's one company, it's like 50-50. So, and points is more of the master. So that's more for when you're producing right. and that's worked out when your song is being recorded by an artist and that's worked out between your lawyer and their label. And you will definitely need a lawyer for that. Right. <laughs> you will not be negotiating that, that stuff yourself. There's so much to know. I still don't know half of it, more than half, most of it. Um, you know, and the points are very difficult to understand. All I know is that, one point on the master is 1%, but then it escalates. Like two points is like six or some, something. Because it has like to that. be just that much more confusing. It's extremely <laughs> confusing. Don't feel bad if you don't understand it. Most people don't understand it. That's when you need a lawyer. Yeah. Right. Good to know. Um, I got a question here um, from music producer Ghost. So I'm going to read the question and then I'm going to try to interpret it, I think. Um, becoming a music producer is just really hard work and making a lot of songs or is it pure luck to have a song blast out and people love you? Like, I guess, like, just asking the question of, like, 
hard work and luck like where does it come together like what is luck even it's both there's definitely a luck component i think hard work is the biggest component i mean talent is important too like if you don't have a knack for it like it's going to be really hard like you know not very athletic i don't think i could be a good football player no matter how, no matter hard, how I hard i try yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly um hard, definitely honestly hard work and experience it's everything right. it's a lot of the times people are like you're so talented and trust me i appreciate the com- compliment but oh it's, just, it's it's almost funny to me i'm like you're not commenting you don't realize that what you're seeing is not talent it's literally like 15 years of me like beating my right. head like a fool and working like eight to ten hours a day <laughs> totally and people get confused by luck too because i think a lot of it comes down to everything you talked about networking before you meet one person and that leads to the next person like it's not luck that you met xyz person it's because you started 10 years ago meeting this person and then it led to that so like yeah you know and there's definitely an element of luck like the way i met my partner ellie you know we were roommates in nashville like I just met her, you know, and we ended up having this relationship, but even then it wasn't, you know, like, Oh oh, wow. We're immediately hit writers. It took so long for us to develop. And she was so young. So she was super green. I was green at the pop stuff. I was good at country really didn't know what I was doing with Bob. Like we had to work. We had to grow in the beginning when like at the very inception of our team, I think we pretty much got together every single day um, and we wrote for these K-pop briefs, whatever tracks we had. And I think we did, yeah, about like six to eight hours every day or maybe not the weekends, but just for months and months and months and months, we were just trying to get better. And that kind of, that kind of hard work for sure pays off. How were you gauging if you were getting better? Like the more, uh, like label response to the records, like, like, did it ever get discouraging? (laughs) And so you listen to your old songs from two months ago. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And when you can tell it sucks is when you know you're getting better. Um, it's it's it is a funny thing. Yeah, it definitely some of it is response for sure. Um, a lot of the times it's just your own sense. So this is like a very this is a topic I never hear anybody talk about. Mm-hmm. Music sense, right? I see this all the time with like new singers, right? I work with like a lot of, you know, young people who are like teenager or whatever. They come in and anything we do, they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. How'd you do that? It's so amazing, right? And the, then, you know, we work with somebody who's 33 and has been in the industry for a long time, you know, and they're just, they're very like calm. They're not like jumping like for everything that we do, you know, go, oh, that's good. Mm, let's keep pushing right here. You know, yeah. you can just tell that, people's music sense gets a lot more sophisticated as they get more experienced. And, you know, that takes just a lot of writing and a lot of listening and even like being in the industry and getting feedback. Um, like with mafia, for example, mafia in the morning, um, that song, there was a lot of rewriting in that song. Um, when we first pitched the demo, they were like, can we have a different pre-course? We wrote them a different pre-course. They didn't like it. We, they asked us for another one. So you're kind of figuring wow. things out. And a lot of the times it's not very straightforward because especially with Korea, sometimes there's a bit of a language barrier. So they won't re- you don't really know what they want. They're trying to communicate. Maybe you're not getting, maybe they're not explaining, like, you know, there's a bit of barrier. So you're learning through guessing things you're learning through communicating with an a and talking to them. You're learning through hanging out with other writers and going, was that your experience too? Oh, this label does this. So there's so many things to learn yeah. and it never stops ever. But yeah, I don't even know what my wow. original point was. I was just rambling, but no, yeah, that's, that's, everything. that's amazing insight. That's great. And, and to maybe this is topical. Um, because Zaire asks, how long does each J-pop or K-pop song take to get uh, complete? I mean, you just talked about that iteration process for Mafia. Are they all kind of like that? A back and forth or are some easier than others? It's, it's, di- it's, diff- it's different for everyone. Actually, Mafia was probably the most challenging one. Um, a lot of the times they like it as is or they just want like one thing tweaked. Um, yeah, with previous songs, honestly, we haven't had many revisions. I think with Talk To Me, no, there wasn't revisions. They just wanted us to, um, there's like a weird reversed vocal, which was Ellie's voice and they wanted us to reverse the girls' voices, like stuff like that. So wait, let me jump in on that. How 
you're you guys are sending stems and then people are either adding on to it or like like mixing they're they're dealing with all the mixing and all the mastering like they're yes, doing all that yeah that always is the case with any label projects there's always separate mixing which thank god because i'm good at mixing but i'm not a top mixer by any stretch of the imagination and to get it to sound like john costelli or something like i can't do that right. <laughs> you know so they usually take care of that mastering like all those things so yeah once a song has been accepted like the production has been accepted we send all the stems they usually record uh the singers there in america with american projects i always record i'm actually a really good vocal producer um but you know i'm not in korea or japan right so their vocal producers do that and honestly at that point our work is done um if they're really respectful and nice like mafia gyp they were really nice they kind of ran all the versions by us. They're like, do you like this? Um, do you wow. accept? They would be like, do you accept this version? Um, like, yes, we love it. That's amazing so, from such a huge company. Yeah, not all of them are like that. A lot of the times with just different projects, like we just hear, oh, it's coming out. And we're like, what? Well, right. Uh, well, that's J-Rap what I was going to ask. It's like, when do you know that it's going to, like, you sub- I, I suppose you submit the track and they say, yes, we're going to use it. But then for some, is it like you never hear about it again until the track comes so, out? So there is actually a step before it's cut. It's called hold, so help, right? So when you get a hold request, that's when you know they're really seriously considering the song. It's it's super rare to get something cut without a hold. Like right. they hold it first. And that's usually like a several months long process. They hold it. They might just kind of, think about it, right? That you might not even be working on anything. They probably have like a pile of songs they're holding, like sifting through them being like, how does this one go with this one? Cause they're like curating this project. Yeah. So, and once you get like a official, yes, the song is getting cut or sometimes you get it's off hold. So they decided not to use it, which we've had happen. So yeah. And at the point that it is cut is when you send the stems and you know, all those things can I use it, send invoices, right. lawyers get involved. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. And for, uh, like for mafia, I wonder like, what was the experience? Like, because that's the lead single off the mini album. So like, what is that? Like, like, Hey, we're not only we're cutting, we're cutting this track and it's going to be the lead single. And like, is that like a huge moment for you? Like, it was definitely a huge moment because we didn't know it was going to be a single. We've known the song was on hold since like last October, I think. So yeah, this takes a while. And um, I think I found out cause I asked my publisher, you know, at the time I was like, Oh, is this like, you know, on just on the record? Like, is it a single? I was like kind of hoping, but I didn't know, you know, and she's like, yes, it's a single. It's coming out April 30th. Wow. Yeah. yeah and that was probably March. I was like, yay. That's crazy. <laughs> so, you know, they don't like, there's a lot of writers. There's a lot of producers involved. They don't like, yeah. keep everybody apprised of every little thing. I do say that they did a good job. They like ran things by us. I thought it was a, a great process for them. That's awesome. Very, very cool. Look into that process. I'm going to try to go through the last couple questions in chat because we're running out of time. Joey Fernandez asks, have you ever had a mentor in your path who had helped you with your work, creativity, or career? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. I'm usually the mentor. I'm usually like the old Yoda. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's always telling all the kids like so it is. No, I really do wish I had a mentor and it's just something that didn't, like I didn't, have come across my path and that's honestly one of the reasons it took so long and yeah like don't be discouraged by like how long it took me most people i know it's taken them you know five years and not 50. <laughs> well even um, so it's, it's it's important for people to hear because it takes different amounts of time for everybody it, i guess it can take a long time i mean most people i know like 10. I, ha- I hate to say it. I hate to like encourage, discourage somebody who's like 18, right? Because yeah. that's like half their life. Like what? Right. You know, but just don't think about the time. Think more about like the process and like your friends and, you know, what you're doing and the music and having fun and learning because it goes by fast. Yeah. But yeah, no, if, unfortunately I haven't had a mentor, but um, I do mentor people now myself because I do think it's really important. For sure. I guess uh, last question like with based on everything you know about the industry and how you came up and how it's changed if you were starting new today and you were entering into the industry today and wanting to do the same things that you're doing now um what would be some of the first steps that you would take to start getting your foot in the door would they be different 
Yeah, they would be different. I definitely would. I would be very like strict with myself about writing. I would write like five days a week, even if it sucked, I would just force myself to write. I would analyze songs that are uh, successful songs and just try to imitate them in the beginning. Like, don't be afraid of that. Don't feel like a fraud because you're imitating, you're new, you know, like if you're new, like you need to learn like construction of songs and then you can break all those rules and be like very creative, but you have to know them first. I would definitely work to create a budget for myself, whether I had like a side job or saying, you know, demos on the side, whatever it was. I hate to say this, but money is very like, it's really helpful. If, especially if you're an artist for writer, producer, I mean, for producer, you need gear. So you need money for that. Yep. Um, for a, an artist, I would definitely hire writers and producers that are, that you admire, you know, Top ones, unless you're like a millionaire, you probably won't be able to afford them. But like, you know, good ones with like good success. I would definitely invest in that. I would not invest into PR, like none of those things yet. Um, And I would really try to network. I wouldn't like write messages to, you know, Cardi B. (laughs) Right. Not going to get a reply probably. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm just joking, but like, don't hit up the number one writer that writes all the biggest songs. Like literally, unless you're like a millionaire, you're going to drop 50 K in their bank account to write with you. Like, don't do that. Um, you know, reach out to people that are like you that are starting out, but are talented, that are dope, um, and create like a relationship with them and grow in the industry with them. Cause that's one thing I definitely lack. Cause you know, it was like an immigrant. I didn't know anybody. Social media was not present at the time. Now I feel like, you can just reach out to anybody on anything. Totally. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Curtis Lewis in chat just said it best. She's dropping diamonds. Yes. Dropping <laughs> dropping gems in the chat tonight. Yay. <laughs> um, Alina, thank you so much for taking the time. This is a really insightful conversation. I feel like we could go on. The chat totally missed our um, our pre-show all about Star Wars and everything. <laughs> it was amazing. I wish I had recorded that. I could release it as a bonus episode, but that's pretty funny. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you again. Thank you everybody for watching. I hope um, you were able to take some value from this. I really appreciate you tuning in. If you caught it in the middle, go watch it back. We're also going to put this up as audio in the podcast feed too. So make sure in the description, let me make sure I did this right. Yes. In the description, Alina's Instagram is there. So if you just go to Alina's Instagram, you'll be able to find all the other links. And then the Liar um, YouTube channel, I've also linked in the description. Amazing tutorials. Um, like don't watch my tutorials. Go watch their tutorials go subscribe to their Thank channel you. like <laughs> go go check those out it's all in the description please show some love follow the artist go subscribe all that good stuff so i thank you all so much for watching alina once again uh thank you for being on the show of course you're so welcome this was fun this is so much fun all right bye everybody thanks so much for watching have a good one